ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Eric Anderson and Mark Jones. Hi, everybody. If you recall, on Tuesday, we introduced you to Acme Insurance. And so today, what we've done is we brought our friends back from Acme Insurance to show you how automation can help you get the most out of private and public clouds. So today, we're going to continue the demo that we started on Tuesday with Mark from Acme. Hey, Mark. Hey, Eric. Glad to be here. We've also got Alex and Ted and Jonathan and uh, Rick to help us as well from NetIQ. Hey, guys. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, Eric, this has really been a great week for us. My team and I have learned so much about NetIQ solutions, and we can't wait to take this knowledge back and really apply it and leverage it in some of the key projects we have coming in the next year at Acme. Well, Mark, on Tuesday, we discussed a number of challenges, if you remember, mm -hmm. right? We looked at solutions for challenge number one. We looked at solutions for challenge number two. And we touched a little bit on number five. Let's quickly review where we were then mm -hmm. to bring the audience back up to date, and then let's go into challenge number sure. three. Sure, sure. Well, I'll tell you, I think it's worth mentioning that uh, during that demo on Tuesday, when we deployed that additional web portal instance, it actually was deployed into the Amazon EC2 cloud. Wow, really? Yep. I didn't realize that. So you use Cloud Manager to actually provision that workload into the cloud? Yep. Oh. Um, in fact, I think Alex. You can tell us more about that. Sure. So the first I'm going to walk you through and show the, the workload we provisioned on Tuesday. And we are in front of the um, Amazon Management Console. And that's the workload here. And um, you know, some of you, and Eric and Mark, you may ask question, you know, how the Cloud Manager made a decision to provision this workload yep. into the public Amazon cloud versus into the private cloud that Acme Alex, has. how did it decide to put it in the cloud versus someplace so else? So if you, if you remember, on Tuesday, we show you the app manager monitoring the condition of the application. Uh, in addition to monitoring the condition of the application, the app manager also can monitor as well as the physical host and the virtual host and the virtual machines uh, on the running on that physical host. So the part of the data that cloud manager received from the app manager on Tuesday uh, it was uh, the monitoring data says that there is no more physical capacity to deploy any more virtual machine on a private cloud on Acme. And based on that data, also on the data that this virtual load or virtual uh, machine will be short-lived because those adjusters are going to be just temporary using that, as well as the urgency of the deploying of the servers and the short-lived of the service. This is how Cloud Manager made this decision, analyzing this data, put that into the Amazon cloud. Wow, Alex, you know, anyone can place an image up in a cloud, but to actually have the system figure out where's the optimal place to put that's, it and put it, wow, that's, correct. that's as impressive. We, as we know that, you know, there are a number of the tools that can place the uh, workloads into the Amazon cloud, but there are only a few of them, maybe just, just cloud manager is the one who can do it on, in an intelligent way. Wow, fantastic. Well, Mark, I think that gives us more insight into solution or challenge number one. Yep. Right? So let's go ahead and dive into challenge number three. OK. So yeah, uh, the, this challenge revolves around the provisioning of temporary users. That's what this is all about. Now, on Tuesday, we showed you the Aegis workflow that its basic goal was to provision a server. Well, we extended that workflow, as you can see here, to do a few more things. Let me zoom in on the one area of the provisioning. And as you see, the provisioning begins with provisioning a group for the disaster response team. Then it selects the best team based on the geography and the number of team members needed. Now, our teams are already pre-trained, so we already know the list of members that will be in each team. So once we identify the team that will be used, then we will call Identity Manager to add those team members to the group that we assigned in, group, in the first step. Ted, that's really cool. So I see how with Aegis we were able to automate the process of creating groups and users. But Rick, why don't we show the audience what was actually happening underneath the covers so they can see how those groups are created and users provisioned. Yeah, so the way we're going to do that is we're going to use the uh, role mapping administrator from Identity Manager. And with that, it's very easy to add users that have been provisioned through this process into the right resources they need in order to perform the tasks to, for the disaster at hand. 
So as you can see, the disaster response team group we have selected here, and I want to go ahead and get, grant them rights out into a cloud-based application, specifically Google Apps. So it's very easy to do that by simply just clicking on the items that I want to provision them to, drag it and drop it onto the particular work area. And after I do that and I click Apply, this will automatically trigger Identity Manager to provision the users into the cloud-based service. So now they're appropriately provisioned. Now the next step to that is to be able to set up the authentication so that they can log into this application. That's very easily done, again, through uh, setting up the corporate directory to provide the authentication. So within this one app, with, within the one icon, I click Configure, look at Authentication, and I simply say Integrate this with my Windows authentication, and I say OK. Now all of these users that we've provisioned to this cloud-based resource can log in through their Active Directory credentials. Now the next piece of this is I have to set up the authentication to the cloud-based resource itself. So going into Google Apps, I click Configure, and all I simply have to do is click this one button, say OK, and the federated authentication between my corporate directory and the cloud-based resource is automatically set up, and mm. it's that easy. Mm. Wow. Point, click, boom, done. Yeah. Yep. Wow. <clears throat> I'll tell you, Rick, one of the main problems we've had in the past when we've you know, experimented with uh, public clouds is that it's kind of out of sight, out of mind, especially for the business managers who, you know, after an employee moves on or changes roles, they, kind of, they forget to go back and remove the uh, access they've granted in the, in the cloud. How does this handle that? So it's very easy. Because we set up our authentication through the corporate directory, mm -hmm. once that user is deprovisioned, all their access is turned off automatically. They will no longer be able to get into the resource. So it's handled for you automatically. Great. Great. That's, that's smart. That's really cool. That's yep. set it and forget it. Yep. Right? Absolutely. They're set. When the temporaries are down, poof, everything's gone. Yep. It's, wow. Amazing. That's really nice not to have to worry about that. Yep, fits right in. Well, I think we've adge addressed challenge number three. Yep. So why don't we go on to challenge number four? Okay, let's okay. do it. So how do I know that I haven't violated ACME's policies with regards to insurance regulations? Well, pretty simple there, Eric. I'll answer that one for you. The way we do that is all of these events of all the different activities that have been going on, we've captured those through Novell Sentinel. So as you can see in the list of events, just a very simple, we had the disaster response, we had the request, uh, we had the approval for that that we saw on Tuesday. We created the workload out in the EC2 cloud. The deployment was marked complete. We created the user groups. We modified the group. So all of that information, uh, all the different security events have been captured into Sentinel, and we can track wait, all that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm looking at that screen, and I'm used to seeing up there users in there and events about actions that it, users have done. You've shown me that before, but I'm not seeing users here. I'm seeing services here. What's going on? Well, a service has an identity just like a person does. And since we track that workload as an identity, just like we did on Tuesday, I can simply click on the event, go back to the same thing I did, show the identity details, and the information about the workload that was created is treated as an identity just like a human, just like a human. but then I can also track who's the owner of that particular resource as well, and there's the person that's responsible for that. Wow, very impressive. So I guess I can trust that my sanction change, yep. putting workloads up in the cloud, I, I can feel pretty good about and know that I've got a level of compliance yep. around it. Um, but you know, could I undo it if there were a policy violation? Rick? Well, you can definitely undo it because all of all of those actions are captured. We want to we know exactly what's supposed to be happening, and if it doesn't happen, we can correlate those types of events know the anomaly, back it out, or at least know, uh, notify an individual that something's gone wrong. Wow, OK, great. That's pretty cool. So I still got another question that's mm -hmm. kind of bugging me a little yep. bit here. How do you know that the service configuration is still in compliance uh, when all this change is going on? Well, that's a great question. Acme is a public company, and so we're regulated under SOX. Mm -hmm. And it is really crucial that as we're making these kinds of changes, even if they're happening automatically, we still need to know for sure that we're staying compliant throughout these changes. Hey, Mark. Yeah. For, for this challenge, we decided to use a secure configuration manager. Okay. We extended our, our Aegis workflow to call SCM before and after all the activities were performed. 
That way we can make sure that nothing we had done had taken us out of compliance. So let's look at the report. So you see this is the re before report, and there are five endpoints, five servers in this particular service. And this, we chose the template that is a SOX COVID template. There are many mm -hmm. others in SCM. So if we lay it side by side with the other one, here's the after report. It shows now there's the new server, and, and everything is also green, meaning we are in compliance. Now, if you know anything about compliance, it's very rare to have everything in compliance that's out of the box. So the exceptions, which we'll see here, there were some exceptions, but those exceptions were uh, defined in Aegis to be automatically ex accepted and approved ahead of time because we knew they were going to happen. So that way it kept us in compliance all throughout the process. Wow, Great. Ted, that's pretty impressive. Mark, you realize what we just saw was we knew what our compliance state was before a yep. change. We tracked compliance all during the change yep. and stayed compliant through all that yep. change. And we can prove it. Wow, I'm impressed. Yep. So the last thing to, to do, I think, is to close out item number five. Yep. So, Jonathan, how can we attack item number five of executive visibility? Well, Eric, you might recall that on Tuesday we took all the data and metrics from the claims processing application and consolidated it all into one single service model. We then took that service model and visualized it in an intuitive and contextually correct diagram on the dashboard. However, in talking to Mark a little bit more, we realized that we needed a little bit more than just that for their environment. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when one of these major disasters strikes, um, we often get just tons of questions coming in from managers and executive stakeholders across the company. They want to know whether or not the IT systems are available and working properly in the context of this uh, disaster. They want to know, is it standing up to the load? Um, have there been any security vulnerabilities? How many claims have come in? Even, you know, how much is this disaster likely to cost us? So, we needed a way to bring that kind of relevant information, not just about the technical health of the service, but also about the compliance and the business health of the application to the right stakeholders at the right time. And you know, those are exactly the types of needs that Operation Center was designed around. So in talking to Mark and several other stakeholders in the company, we came up with a few other views that we could show. So here we have a view for applications for the application owners. And it shows things such as claims processed, how many employees were working at any given point in time, and how many claims they were processing. We came up with a view for the CSO mm -hmm. that shows identity, security, and compliance. We came up with a view for the CEO, which shows the important business KPIs, the impact that this is actually having on the business, such as revenue versus forecast, expenses as a percentage of sales as a result of this. We even came up with a view for human resources that just shows where personnel are. So as you can see, we were able to produce a very broad range of views with a lot of different types of data to suit the various users in the environment there. Cool, very nice. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you, this kind of portal that aggregates these disparate data types, it's going to be really invaluable for us because we can now provide self-service visibility into the service. Uh, and previously, that would have required a ton of resource-intensive you know, emails and phone calls, and it's tough when that's happening right in the middle of trying to cope with the disaster scenario at the same yeah, time. Yeah, indeed it would. Yeah. Well, it looks like Operations Center is going to go a long way towards addressing item number five. So with that, I think we've addressed all of the challenges that ACME has identified for us. They now have a service that's optimized, managed, access controlled, and secured with visibility for all the key stakeholders. Well, I, I'll tell you, Eric, we're really excited about it. And you know, I can't say that my team looks forward to the next disaster. But at least they know that with NetIQ's solutions in place, our IT systems are going to be able to effectively support those field personnel who are out there on the ground helping the folks that have been impacted by the disaster. It gives us peace of mind to know that we're helping bring peace of mind to Acme's customers. Yeah, indeed it does. Thank you, Mark. Yep. So I want to take just a couple minutes and just explain briefly something that you've all wanted to know for the last couple years. And that is, what is Workload IQ? 
On Tuesday and Friday, we demonstrated for you Workload IQ in action. So what is Workload IQ? It's a method for loosely coupling management services to govern the life cycle of a business service. What's required to get to the point of Workload IQ? Well, what you've been seeing NetIQ do over the last two years is add the following four things to each of our products. The first is virtualization and virtualization awareness. The second is web-friendly interfaces so that the services can talk to each other. The third element is eventing so that each of the services are generating operational and security events for audit and security and compliance purposes. And fourth was automation so that we could bring them all together. So what's the benefit of Workload IQ to you? Well, it's simply this, and that is that you gain visibility and control over business services that now are identity infused, they're optimized, they're secure, they're compliant, and they're cost effective. And so the question is, where do you start? Well, we've observed that people tend to start and enter into the Workload IQ experience through one of two different ways. The first is through the virtualization and performance path. They start to look at services, virtualize those, and then try to get those under control in management. The other way that we see that people do it is they enter through the identity path. So they'll start with identity, they'll move to access management, then subsequently to security and compliance. The key takeaway here is that for each of those areas where you may enter with a particular product, you will generally tend to move into the adjacent area. And the question is, how do you do that seamlessly and efficiently? And how do you do that with either products from NetIQ or products from third-party vendors? The answer is Workload IQ. And with that, thanks, Mark. Thanks, team. And you guys have been a great audience. Thank you very much.